First of all, the Earth's orbit is slightly elliptical, so its speed varies throughout the year. I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> Th then we com well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compared to experiment or experience compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make any difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. Question coming in now. Um, Dr. Smith, is there any kind of experiment that could lead to the empirical knowledge about geocentrism? Well, I think you've just spent the last 20 minutes telling us about 
Yeah, our <coughs> classical physics, which obviously is based upon empirical um, uh, experiments, uh, actually uh, stands on the side of geocentrism. Uh, it singles out geocentric coordinates as stationary, and these are the coordinates, and these are the only reference frames in terms of which these equations hold. You can just as well take the origin of your coordinate system when you're trying to calculate the motion of the sun and moon and stars centered at the Earth. Well, in, I think it was 2013, a physicist by the name of Luka Popov mm -hmm. wrote a beautiful paper uh, where he did just that. Uh, yeah. To the best of my knowledge, he's the first uh, physicist to do that. It's not easy, by the way, because you have to use uh, Newton, Mach, Newton a la Ernst Mach. You have to uh, invoke the Mach's principle, and then you have to use a Tychonian system, otherwise the equations become, get out of hand and so forth. So there is technically challenging and he did it. And I think it is, it should be widely known because this also sets the whole question at rest. There is no uh, reason on earth to believe that heliocentrism is uh, physically correct. Now, uh, another, another point that I would like to make about Dr. Popov's paper uh, that's really quite remarkable. Uh, Dr. Popov published that paper after a very interesting peer review process. It was published in the European Journal mm -hmm. of Physics. And Dr. Popov was standing for his doctoral examination when this paper appeared and just, woo, you know, mm -hmm. he was challenged on this and he was challenged on that and he was challenged on stellar parallax. Oh, and, uh, and he just calmly went about mm -hmm. using the mathematical precision uh, to show that these challenges were invalid. And his paper withstood all of these challenges and remains uh, published in the European Journal of Physics today. What I'm very happy to say is that Dr. Popov got that doctorate. You know, he, he, was, he was able to stay in the saddle against the uh, rather s severe buffeting uh, that his paper got. And uh, Dr. Popov is now uh, a, a doctor of physics and, uh, and made it all the way through, which I think is a marvelous thing. I wonder if you might uh, examine or, or share with us your examinations of some of these, uh, these other evidences concerning the relativity theory. Well, uh, if you want to jump into the uh, cosmology, this is in a way the most exciting um, application of, in this instance, general relativity theory. Incidentally, if the special theory falls, the general theory falls too, and uh, it's my belief that the special theory has fallen. It does not square with the empirical evidence. So then neither does the general. Well, based upon general relativity, as I think our audience is well aware, um, perhaps the longest, most expansive research project in the history of mankind has unfolded, leading to the so-called Big Bang cosmology. And so now every school child knows that the universe reputedly is so many billion years old. So let us uh, consider f uh, a little how this theory has fared. Well, the fact of the matter is it really has fared very badly from the beginning. In other words, early on it turned out that the these facts don't fit. That was remedied. Another set of facts don't fit. For example, it was found that 
the expansion of the universe in the within the first second is not fast enough to make everything work. So a very brilliant physicist uh, invented something called inflation, which incidentally now is in big trouble. But the point that I want to make is that this um, technique of uh, introducing what is technically called ad, ad hoc hypothesis. Ad hoc means as much as picked out of thin air. There's no reason. You make this hypothesis, you postulate it precisely to, f to remedy some problem. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this has been going on. So every time an ad hoc hypothesis is put in place, another problem arises, another ad hoc hypothesis appears. Uh, one it's of not the, calculated to give one the greatest degree of confidence, is uh, it? One of the uh, <laughs> distinguished astronomers of our time, Brent Tully, put it rather in a funny way, he said, it's disturbing that every time there's a new observation, there's a new theory. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, 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 it's really is true. So this technique of uh, remedying difficulties through the introduction of ad hoc hypotheses is a very questionable thing. It's, it is a technique, incidentally, which has been used for a long, long time to keep Darwinist uh, evolution theory in, uh, in, in business. So uh, uh, time and again, as when a problem in, in this part of science comes up, you very ingeniously discover an ad hoc hypothesis which keeps things going. The, the, the fortunate thing is that in the case of Big Bang cosmology, we don't need to answer that question because uh, something happened in the way of empirical findings which ends this process. Something happened which no ad hoc uh, hypothesis can remedy. And you're the expert on this, <laughs> and as I think most of the people in the audience here will be well aware, I'm referring to the so-called axis of evil, so named because it really does put an end to Big Bang cosmology. And so um, first this appeared in a kind of a un imperfect form. Another satellite was sent up to completely yeah, there, there solve were, there, the there problem. There were vague hints of it. Max Tegmark told me that there were just vague hints of in something Kobe. fishy for the Kobe satellite. Uh, then they sent up the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe that was specifically designed to look at these fishy things. And boy, well, that's when the axis of evil really yeah. gets going. And it, it's called the axis of evil for very good reason, just as you said. Uh, it causes big headaches oh. for, for anybody who's trying to prop up uh, standard Big Bang cosmology. But the key, and this is, of course, the, one of the really great moments in the principle, is that they sent a third. They sent a third mission. This one they called the Planck mission after Max Planck. And I'm sure he was happy as a clam when, when the results came back. And not only is the axis there, but it's no longer possible, as Max Tegmark said, you know, when, when, the, when the microwave axis was first discovered, <coughs> Max was absolutely persuaded that there was something wrong. They showed it to be lined up with the ecliptic of our solar system. There's no way. There's got to be something fishy in the data. But as he says uh, brilliantly at the end of the... Uh, of the second interview he does in the principle, he says, you know, but I, I have to have my brain override my gut. My gut was telling me there was something wrong, but the data, it's there. Now, reasonable people can argue about what it means, but it's really, we're past the point of arguing about whether it's there. And what is there now is a special direction. Well, that's hideous news for a Big Bang and for basically, and an Einsteinian covariant universe where every reference frame is supposed to be just as good as any other. But it's much worse than that. Because the special direction is not just any special no. direction. 
Why don't you tell us about that, that special direction? <laughs> well, this is a worst case scenario. It's adding <laughs> insult to injury. Um, the, this great circle in the CMB, in the cosmic microwave background, which has now been documented beyond any uh, possibility of doubt, it happens to line up with the ecliptic of our solar system. Just amazing. So uh, we have to recall in, in, Einstein, in the Einsteinian universe, the Earth is a random speck within a galaxy, which is itself just a random speck. So this speck within a speck uh, now controls the, the global geometry of the cosmos. Divides the whole cosmos neatly yes. in two. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is so astounding. And I, I must say, the principle has been finished for almost four years now. And you can still find nothing that really shows you the significance of that ecliptic alignment, like the wonderful fly-through animation that Buff, uh, Buff Compagnie Paris did for that film, and which remains the only place in the world where you can really yeah, see that's right. the significance and how stupendously unpredicted and, frankly, unwelcome. Uh, <laughs> that's an understatement. <laughs> Over the past decade or so, we have seen out to the very limits of the observable cosmos. We've mapped its largest structure, the cosmic microwave background, the oldest light in the universe, according to the standard Big Bang model of cosmology. What we have discovered is shocking. ESA has released a new map showing the first light of the universe that challenges some of the fundamental principles of the Big Bang theory. This latest cosmic microwave background map from Planck, ESA's mission to investigate the origins of the universe, questions some of the concepts behind the basic theory of the expansion of the universe, commonly known as inflationary theory. You know, we see uh, these strange patterns that are not expected you know, in inflationary theory, the simplest inflationary theories. It may be that, uh, that we've been fooled, that inflation didn't happen. And you know, you know, it's perfectly possible that that um, that there was some phase of the universe before the Big Bang actually happened, where you can track the history of the universe to a period, a pre-Big Bang period. In constant rotation, Planck scans the entire sky at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. Visible light telescopes see little more than the tapestry of galaxies around us but by making measurements at wavelengths between the infrared and radio, Planck is able to work back in time and show us the history of the universe from the first light ever produced. These fossil radiations resulting from the Big Bang are called the cosmic microwave background. What's surprising in Planck's latest findings and is inconsistent with pervading theories is the presence of unexpected large-scale anomalies in the sky, including a large cold region, stronger fluctuations in one half of the sky than the other, and less light signal than expected across the entire sky. When you look at only at the large features on, on this map, you find that the, our, our best fitting model, our best theory, has a problem fitting the data. When you look at only at the large features on, on this map, you find that the, our, our best fitting model, our best theory, has a problem fitting the data, has a problem fitting the data, has a problem fitting the data. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. When Alan Dulles brought in all the Nazi scientists and so forth, they went to two places. They went to CIA and they went to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration which in our world we call it not a space agency. Which in our world we call it not a space agency. <laughs> and as Kathy O'Brien has said so clearly, that's where the bulk of the mind control has been done. That's where the bulk of the mind control has been done. Perfect place for us to 
Yeah.